Kelly with Healthy Place. Today we're going to be talking about a dual diagnosis with our guest Sarah and later we'll be talking with um, licensed therapist Dr. Amy Quinn. So as we go along uh, please share your comments and your questions down in the chat box and uh, we'll get with them as the show goes on or we'll address them as the show goes on. I'm sorry about that. So first, let me bring on Sarah. There she is. So again, we're talking about dual diagnosis today. Let me, and let me get my posture right. <laughs> and I'm nervous. I've never done this. <laughs> it's all right, Sarah. It's perfectly fine. I get nervous all the time, too. So we'll just talk and we'll get through it together. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Well, um, you were first diagnosed with bipolar disorder at 16. So what was it like for you then? Well, at 16, I i mean, any typical teenager, i that was my first suicide attempt, actually, when I was 16 years old. And they diagnosed me with being bipolar, but, you know, I didn't know, and I'm going to use my hands, because I didn't know what it was. I mean... Mm -hmm. And I got out of the hospital after being in there for like 28 days. And I didn't do, I didn't stay on the medication. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, at 16, you think you can conquer the world at your own space or whatever, you know, you just don't do it. Right. So I, I ended up, um, just didn't stay on medication. Okay. So that, um, probably aggravated things i imagine but you wouldn't have noticed that you wouldn't have known it was being aggravated because you were 16 and on top of the world yeah, so. yeah, being at 16 you don't know anything you know right ever my parents could have told me to take the pills and i'm sure they did tell me to take the medication they my doctor prescribed me but mm -hmm. i just didn't know once again at 16 what to do and what not to do right all right so um two years after that initial diagnosis, it's when you started drinking. Um, was there something that prompted that? What was behind that decision? Well, I was a senior in high school. So, of course, you get curiosity, you know, does whatever. And you start drinking. And the next thing I knew, I'm like, oh, well, this makes me feel better. And this makes my anxiety go away. This makes, makes my depression go away. And I um, started drinking at 18 because I was ha I was having so much anxiety and so much depression at the time and I didn't realize what caused depression and anxiety because mm -hmm. I never, at 16 when I was being diagnosed as being bipolar I never realized that I was actually bipolar until later in life when I was like oh this is really what bipolar is mm -hmm. So, okay, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to the Healthy Place Instagram Live. Uh, we're talking to Sarah about her life with dual diagnosis of bipolar disorder and alcoholism. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box and we will get to it as we go along. We're also looking for your comments. Maybe you have um, something to share about your experience with dual diagnosis or addiction or mental illness. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. And I, uh, we'll share those comments, too. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm open to anything. Because I'm so new to, like, being in recovery. I mean, I'm 49, st 49 days in recovery. And don't, I mean, every day is a challenge. Every moment's a challenge. Every minute's a challenge. That I'm not, I mean, I'm on great meds that help with cravings and all this type of stuff. But on their hand, it's just life. I mean, alcohol, you go on Facebook and it's everywhere and anywhere. Or you go on Instagram, it's everywhere. They're advertising it. They're doing this. The, I mean, everywhere in life is alcohol. And it's like, I can't do alcohol and be bipolar at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, uh, it, it, it would be a difficult thing um, to definitely deal with, you know, and it, Congratulations on your sobriety. I mean, thank you so much. Like, a great accomplishment. And I do want to talk more about that um, a little later. Okay. But <laughs> that is really <laughs> 49 days. 49 days. Um, so 
the drinking got worse over the years after you were 18. Um, and besides the obvious addiction to alcohol, were there... Medication. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's okay. Um, all right. So your drinking got worse over the years, but um, were, were there things happening in your life that caused you to drink more, or was it more of a self-medication? It was more of a self-medication for me. I mean, I was dealing with, you know, the, the boyfriends, the girlfriends, not girlfriends, but boyfriend-type situations, but it was more of a self-medication for me because I realized, what like, I don't want to say it now, but I realized at the moment in time that it was helping with my anxiety, so, like, in my depression, but then the next day, I would sit there and feel just the much as just as anxiety and this much as depression, so I would pick up the habit to make the depression and anxiety go away. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that it was uh, mostly daytime drinking when we spoke I'm earlier. Is that because like you'd wake up and those feelings would start right away? So you looked for that? I was a day drinker. And I'm, I mean, not that I'm still am. Up until 49 days ago, I was a day drinker. Because mm -hmm. I would wake up with the anxiety and the depression of, being drunk the day before to the point where I had to pick myself back up to feel better. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the medications, you know, now that I've learned, didn't work the way they were supposed to work because of I was, was do I mean, I they don't work. Right. Uh, so have you, well, let me see here. The, the medications, it's very hard to get a good medication regimen for bipolar disorder because all of us are so different. And do you think that the drinking complicated that? Are I'm, you? I'm sure it did because on the other hand, I've been on so many different medications for so many, mm -hmm. like they, my doc, I've been to different doctors and this, until I found the right doctor in the last like year or so and the right therapist and stuff like that, did I realize that, um, this medication works versus this medication. Like I've been on probably every single type of medication there has been for bipolar. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if you're going to talk about this later, going back to when I was 25, I mean, I had great insurance. I had a great job. I had everything. And I just knew something wasn't right in my head. And mm -hmm. he put me on medication and he would sit there and tell me, you know, you're on the highest doses I could put anybody on, but something, I was like, well, something's not working here. Right. And still, like, but the thing is, too, I was just drinking just as heavy as to, now. I look back, I was drinking as heavy, and so the medication wasn't working, probably, the way it needed to work. So, there was, uh, okay, as the years went by, how did the bipolar disorder and addiction, how did it spread out and affect your life? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> it affected my whole, and it still to this day affects my life because I've lost friends, I've lost families, I've had a DWI, I've had arrests for uh, fighting, I've had arrests for probably stealing something, I've had arrests for everything and anything, and it all goes back to alcohol. Every single thing that I ever got in trouble for went back to alcohol. Mm -hmm. And went back to even, I could probably look at the bipolar part of it. And they, when, we, when we talked the other day, I don't know the difference right now. I'm learning the difference between alcohol. Like, did I do that because I was the alcohol or did I do that because I was bipolar? I'm learning that now. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I don't know the difference. But it, it cost me my whole entire life. I mean, I just saw my sister join this thing. And she could probably chime in and tell you it has destroyed my life. And that's why I quit drinking. Very, yeah. Um. It's destroyed, it has destroyed my life. It destroyed every friendship I ever have had. It has destroyed every job I ever had. I am, I don't, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I'm on disability because my bipolar got so bad at a point in my life that mm -hmm. I couldn't hold a job. Do you think um, 
You say you're getting used to sorting out the difference between what was the alcohol and what's bipolar. What about the hypomania or the manias? Do you remember anything happening during those in particular? For me, it was more of I'm the depressed part mm -hmm. of where I'm depressed 24 7. Where I remember even years ago, I would go to my grandparents for Christmas and sweat me sweatpants and sweatshirt and my my blanket and lay on their couch because I didn't mm -hmm. want to do anything. And it wasn't it, it wasn't a fun. I mean, yeah, it was a fun situation. I got myself out of the house, but it wasn't a fun situation. As far as the mania, I mean, I've never really done the whole let me go spend millions of dollars. I mean, I have spent money, but I've never had like the crazy sexual encounters and stuff like that. I mean, I probably had in somewhere in my life, but I mm -hmm. never had the hype part of it affect my life so much where the the depression part destroyed my life because I would go for the depression would go drink. Right. Right. And okay. By the time you were 30, which is um, 14 years after bipolar diagnosis and 12 years after you started drinking. So at about 30, uh, you ended up in a hospital. So I, what happened with that? That was the worst part of my entire life. I um, had my life. I had the best thing in the whole entire world. I had an amazing job. I had amazing at that time an ex-boyfriend. I had my family, my friends, my whole entire world was together. And I chose alcohol over that world. I, that's when everybody knew that my alcohol was the worst. Mm -hmm. And I lost everything. I literally lost it all. And I tried to commit suicide. And it was the worst. And I could probably show you my scar on my hand to the point where they, I literally severed my arm. And I spent 10 days uh -huh. in a coma and to the point of, and 29 days just or in the hospital just because of insurance, whatever. Because my alcohol level was a 0. 0.5 when the hospital. And they said that if the alcohol didn't kill me, then I would have, if that, me kept trying to kill myself, the alcohol would have killed me. Wow. Yeah. I'm so, sorry for that. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, it, it, it made me stronger inside, and it made me who I am today. So, you know, I don't want to preach God or whatever. God puts everything in your life for a reason. Mm -hmm. So, on our hand, it, it, it happened for a reason, because it woke me up. But the crazy thing is, I still didn't stop drinking, because I didn't know how to stop drinking at that point in my life. So what about it? What changed? You said it woke you up. So what changed? It woke me up that I never wanted to try to commit suicide again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got on medication and I, I've taken them pretty successfully for the last 10 years. But I didn't, I didn't quit drinking. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't quit. So these medications weren't as successful as they needed to be as me being sober. Right. And you said you didn't, you didn't know how to quit, which I I, quit. I've heard that before too, you know, just don't know how to do it. And even like the, in the hospital, like when I was released, being released and stuff, they were like, what about a 28? Like, why don't you go do a program? And even, I mean, that's, I'm 41 now. And even 11 years ago, I look back and I'm like, well, that's crazy to think of life that way, but I didn't know how to sit there. Like, I associated alcohol with every event that I ever have been to. Like, mm -hmm. I like, okay, I can't go to a cookout without alcohol. I can't get to this without alcohol. I can't get to that without alcohol. And it, it was a hard situation because I had alcohol so in my mind that it controlled my mind. Yeah, that makes sense. And what, um, like you said earlier, today's 49 of your, day 49 of your sobriety. And uh, what, what prompted you to stop drinking now? I honestly woke up one morning and I said I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that really was exactly what it was. I thought, I ended up trying to move to D.C. with my roommate from college. Ended up getting a great babysitting job up there, a great this 
a life up there. And, and my family was so happy for me. I finally was like out of the way, not out of the way, but this out of, you know, moving and doing and making a life of my own and doing this. And I got up there and alcohol was there and it became even more of a problem because the ABC store was right next door. My, not that anything was against my roommate at the time, but um, my roommates worked in the service industry. So they would get home at like two or three in the morning and I would get up at six in the morning and they would be up still from the night before. So of course I was like, Oh, let's have a beer with them, you know? So now right. I knew I was drunk by 10 or 11 and they're going to bed knowing I'd already been to bed the night before and mm -hmm. I'd wake back up at five when they had to go to work. So it was just, and all of a sudden one day sitting up there, I literally was said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I came home not realize that I'm now back in Charlotte, that I would be here as long as I have been because all my clothes are still in DC and I haven't gone up there to get them. But I literally said, I don't want to do this anymore. And I came home and literally the next day I checked myself into a detox program here in Charlotte mm -hmm. and they referred me to a place. And here I am 49 days later. And congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. And uh, we're going to bring on therapist Amy Quinn in just a minute. Um, but before we say goodbye, is there anything? Oh, sorry. One comment. I uh, Weeping alone, Jens, I've been smoking weed and drinking for years to deal with my depression and anxiety. And like Sarah, my life's been a wreck. So I'm sure you can identify with that. <laughs> Like I will admit it, I smoked weed up until pretty much this whole situation too, on and off. I mean, not every day, but pretty much on and off to the point of somebody asked me today, are you still smoking weed? And I was like, I haven't since I quit drinking and I have no desire to even, I just don't want to put any substance in my body that's going to alter my mind right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's probably kind of exciting and brand new in there, you know, getting acquainted with, <laughs> with who you are. So that that's interesting. Uh, okay, so uh, is there something else you'd like to share with our audience? You know, maybe something you've learned or are learning? It's, you can do it. I mean, I honestly never, ever, ever thought I would be here. And I never thought I would give up alcohol. I never thought I would give up alcohol. I thought I'll, my liver would take me or something would take me as far as alcohol. But here I am 49 days later, and I'm like, oh, my God, you really can give it up. And you can have a better life. And as far as being the bipolar part of it, take your medication. Here I am. I take my meds every day. I went to talk to my psych doctor on Tuesday, and she upped a dosage of one of the medications I'm on just to help me with the anxiety and the depression because I, my depression and anxiety is crazy right now because of, I don't know how to handle it without the alcohol. Mm -hmm. They're work. My doctors are working with me. I've seen a therapist weekly now. Oh, and just, it, it's an amazing life. Once you get your life together. Well, again, I'm so happy for you. I think this is amazing, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. You sure. You've been a great guest. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, next we're going to talk to um, licensed therapist Amy Quinn. So let me find her. There you are. There she is. Hi, Amy. Hi. Good How to see you. you. Can you it's hear good. me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Great. So um, I came across this, and I kind of got to read it. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 45% of people in the United States struggle with a dual diagnosis. Um, people diagnosed with a mental health condition are about twice as likely to twice as likely than the general population to suffer from substance use disorder. And does that surprise you at all? Um, no, it 
it doesn't. I think, um, Sarah, and thank you, Sarah, for, for sharing. It was great to hear your story. And um, I think Sarah kind of said it in her um, testimony is that, you know, she was having a hard time um, dealing with her diagnosis and really managing it. And so the alcohol really helped her to just kind of um, manage her mood for a little bit. And I think mm -hmm. that 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 is pretty common with people that have a mental health issue. Like it's hard to manage it. If, and if you don't like taking the medicine or if you're not taking the medicine, then alcohol or drugs is a way to sort of, you know, um, manage it. So uh, what mental health conditions are generally associated with a dual diagnosis? Um, bipolar disorder, depression, um, anxiety, Mm -hmm. I think all of those are pretty common with, um, with substance abuse, for sure. And like that, depression and anxiety kind of underlie almost every mental illness you can have. So is right. mm -hmm. um, so um, I think a lot of people believe that not being properly diagnosed and treated is associated with the increased chance of drug use or alcohol. So is, is that the case? Is that where the problem lies in not being properly diagnosed and treated? Yeah, I think that actually has a lot to do with it. I think a lot of times when you have a mental health issue, um, you might have minor symptoms when you're a teenager, but you might not have a diagnosis. You might experience a little bit of depression or anxiety, but you might never get treatment. Um, they say it takes, I think, about 10 years from when you actually experience your first symptom to when you actually get treatment for for mm -hmm. those symptoms. So it could be a lot of times between the time that you experience something and you're dealing with it, and then you maybe kind of dabble with alcohol and drugs, and it might be, you know, usually it does, it, your symptoms start kind of in your teen years and young adult years, and those are the times that drugs and alcohol are really accessible to you. So you might, you know, get that first taste of alcohol or have that, you know, first taste of marijuana and it, it makes you feel um, calm or it makes you feel better than you've been feeling. It, it helps to sort of stabilize your mood temporarily and so you, you go back to it because you feel good doing it. Do you think that uh, people who start using in their teenage years, does that make it longer before they go to get diagnosed? It seems like if it's covering the symptoms for you, then maybe you don't really have that problem. You do, right. but you're yeah. thinking that, about it. That's a, yeah, that's a really good question and a really good point. I think that might have something to do with it because, you know, you're doing kind of what's socially appropriate, you know, especially if you're in college, you're attending parties, and you're drinking with your friends, and that's, that's socially acceptable in college. And so you might just think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really bad because I drank a lot this weekend, but, you know, um, over time, you know, the consistent and persistent use of alcohol and drugs really has a long-term effect on your mental health and actually makes it worse. So, um, again, you, you might just not be as self-aware checking in with your Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And on these medications, on mental health medications, most every one of them says do not drink, you know, do not use with alcohol. And what can happen when you're using psychiatric drugs and drinking? Well, I think Sarah said it uh, pretty good is that, you know, my medicines just weren't working. And that's kind of what will happen over time if you use alcohol, if you use drugs. Your medicines that are supposed to help you with um, your your depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder, they just won't be as effective. And so you'll experience your symptoms and, you know, it, it persistently could get worse. Your symptoms could get worse and, and most likely will if you, if you continue to use them. So I just had a question in my mind and it slipped it, but um, I guess treatment for this, how do you treat dual diagnosis? Do you do the addiction first and the mental illness later? Does it matter? How does that work? You know, I think it really depends on the person. Um, I think that you have to treat them um, separately, but be mindful of them, of both of them. So, um, you know, getting stabilized on medication is really important. Um, but if you're drinking and if you haven't dealt with, you know, your addiction, then 
getting the stabilization on medication is not really going to happen. So um, you really kind of need to do it almost in parallel process. Um, but if someone is, is willing to, you know, get the help that they need for addiction first, um, you know, that's, that's a good start. But really, um, you know, usually when you, when someone is treating, whether it's treating you as a therapist or a psychiatrist, they, they are aware of both of them, unless you're not being honest with your, um, with the person who's helping you about your drinking. And so that's also really important because that might be a huge piece that's missing um, in their knowledge and then in their treatment is going to be not as effective. That makes sense. And uh, did you have anything else you'd like to add to all of this? Um, yeah, I think, you know, if, if people are looking for some resources on this, there's a lot of good books. Um, there's uh, a book called Out of the Shadows by Patrick Carnes. That's more about sexual addiction, but it does talk about the addiction cycle and kind of the, you know, uh, you know the, what happens in your brain when, when, when you're thinking about using and you're thinking about using alcohol. It's a whole cycle of sort of, you know, looking forward to using the alcohol and then, you know, obtaining the alcohol and then, and then actually, you know, getting that sort of feeling when you do it and then kind of what comes after that. So I think understanding that it's a cycle and that, you know, it's oftentimes genetic. It oftentimes runs in the family. So really understanding and kind of getting your hands on some of the um, adult um, children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families literature. There's a very good book that Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, has and that they've written. And it's, it's really helpful for people that come from like an addiction cycle. Or even if you have, I mean, sometimes if, even if your parent is not addicted, but say they're their, their parent was addicted, the cycles tend to run, run in the family. So just being aware of some of those things. Mm -hmm. And then just understanding, um, you know, there's a, another book called Super Normal by Meg Jay. And it's, um, it just talks about, you know, some of the things that you can go through as a child and, and, and a young adult that can kind of, you know, um, might cause you to want to pursue drugs and alcohol and what that looks like. And then also just using some of those um, some of those experiences to sort of make you a stronger person. It can really, adversity can really lead to more um, resilience in your life and how to sort of understand how that works. Well, thank you so much for being on today, Dr. Dr. Quinn. I, I'm always happy to see you. Oh, so. well, it's good to see you. And, and just thank you for having me on. It was great to talk. Sure. We'll see you next time. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye. All right, so that concludes our Instagram Live today, and I'm glad you joined us uh, for trusted, detailed information on mental health topics, um, symptoms, treatments, just anything you would really want to look for about mental health. Um, visit healthyplace.com, and we'll be back in two weeks with another Instagram Live, and I hope to see you then.